Reverend Joel Patinos. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Thumbs up? Good. Um, I brought my Yeti mic just in case because I'm outside. and But if I don't need it, I don't need it. So happy 4th of July, everybody. It's a little complicated these days talking about 4th of July. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that, that this can be a difficult holiday and complicated for some people because freedom and independence still needs to happen on a greater scale uh, in this country and of course in the world. So I just want to honor everybody and honor uh, the spirit of 4th of July. And isn't it amazing that today uh, it's appropriate that the lesson is what the mystics taught because it's all about spiritual freedom and spiritual independence in a sense. Um, so that's where we're going to be today. But first and most importantly, before you mute me, I uh, will give you the jokes. So what I did today is uh, a lot. I, I actually got several emails last time from people who love the dad jokes. So I went through probably 50 or 60 of uh, the 4th of July dad jokes, ran them by my family, and these are the only eight that got laughs. So these are what I'm calling the top eight 4th of July dad jokes. All right, here we go. Uh, and you know, you have that button at the bottom that's called reactions. So you can thumbs up, thumbs down, you can applaud, you can do whatever. Okay, here we go. Number one, what do you call a snowman on the 4th of July? A puddle. All right, next. <laughs> All right. What do you get if you cross a patriotic American with a small curly haired dog? A Yankee poodle dandy. <laughs> All right, where was the Declaration of Independence signed? Right there at the bottom of the page. <laughs> um, all right, what does the Statue of Liberty stand for? Because she can't sit down. All right, which American colonists told the most riddles? The Pun Sylvanians. What kind of tea did the colonists want? Liberty. Just two more. What did the American flag say to the other flag? Nothing, it just waved. And finally, what was the most important day or most popular dance in 1776? The independence. <laughs> oh, I, I do love those, I have to admit. Well, as my first grade teacher said, I would give you an A for effort, you know. <laughs> yeah. If you think those are bad, you should have heard the other 42. So uh, let's turn now to uh, our textbook in the Science of Mind. And this week we're, chap uh, we're studying a chapter on what the mystics have taught. It's chapter 20. It's actually the first part of uh, the first chapter in part four, which he calls the perfect whole. And um, it's very apt that we start the perfect whole with the chapter called what the mystics taught. I originally made notes and a lot of times when I do talks, I just write notes down. I keep a page open on my computer screen and I just start taking notes. I got about six pages in and I thought, unless they want an eight hour talk, uh, let me go back to the chapter and follow along Ernest Holmes. So we'll do a mystic workshop or class at another point. So we're just gonna very briefly go through some of the things in this chapter to really get a sense of mysticism and what the mystics talked about. and. For those of you who have read or not read, uh, first of all, it's on page 327 where we're starting. Um, the very first sentence of this chapter, he gives two very important pieces of information about the mystics and mysticism. He says, a mystic 
is not a mysterious person, but one who has deep, uh, a deep inner sense of life and his unity with the whole. That's one. Second sentence, mysticism and psychism are entirely different. So he does something right at the start. The first thing he does is he says, mystics are not other than us. They are us. We are um, akin to the mystics. And I'll get into that in a minute. But he doesn't want you to think that they're an exalted being of any sense. They're just people. But the second thing he does is he says, don't confuse it with other stuff, the occult sciences. Um, and that's okay, because sometimes in spirituality, we use the same words and they mean different things. So he's just clarifying that what we're talking about are the mystics of old, the mystics of different religions, the Rumis, the St. Francis's, not stuff like psychic um, material. And he does go into that a little bit in this chapter. But then also in this very first paragraph, he says this, there's nothing mysterious in the truth so far as it is understood, comma, but all things seem mysterious until we understand them. So mysticism is not something that is a mysterious other. It's something that we can underst understand and should be understood. Years ago, when I used to be a buyer of a, a bookstore that had a large religion, philosophy, mythology, spirituality, area. I was the buyer for that area. Um, people used to come in all the time with their problems and say, can I get a book on this? I'm going through a divorce. Do you have a book? I want to be more creative. Do you have a book, etc. And one time a woman came in and she came up to me and she said, I need a book that will help me to understand an experience that I had a few years ago. And I said, all right, tell me what the experience was and I'll find you the book. And she said, oh, I couldn't do that. And I said, you couldn't do what? She goes, I couldn't tell you what my experience was. And I said, well, then how am I gonna find a book to help you understand what the experience is if I don't know what the experience is? I'm not a psychic. And she said, all right, all right, I'll tell you. She pulled me around the corner and she whispered very loudly, don't they call that Soto voce or something like that in theater where it's like the loud whisper. So she whispered loudly so I could hear. She goes, well, several years ago, I was laying in bed and I was just laying there and all of a sudden a bright light came out of nowhere. It was like a big ball of light. And out of this light came hundreds and hundreds of angels and every one of the angels had the face of my sister who had died a few years before that. And I said, wow, that's pretty amazing. How did you feel when that happened? And she said, well, I felt, I felt so calm and peaceful. I felt so good. I felt like my sister was trying to tell me that she's still there and that there is no death and that everything is love. And, and I just... It was amazing. I still remember it so clearly after all these years. And I need a book to tell me what it was. And I said, ma'am, you don't need a book to tell you what that was. I can tell you what that was. You had a mystical experience of the divine. And she looked at me in horror. And she said, I can't have a mystical experience. I'm a Presbyterian. We sometimes think that mystical stuff is for others. But really it's for us. It's right there where we are at. Later on that same page, he says, uh, he talks about the different kinds of mystics that really have informed our world throughout history. Certainly there are the religious ones that we talked about, Rumi, uh, etc. But he says that you can find mystics in any tradition, poets, scientists, artists, philosophers, etc. And on page 328, he says this. He says, um, man, let's not use the word man always. Human, humans have compelled nature to do their bidding. We have harnessed electricity, caught the wind, trapped steam, and made all of them do our will. 
We have invented machines to do the work of thousands. We have belted the globe with traffic and built up a wonderful civilization. But in few cases have we conquered our own souls. The mystic has revealed things that do not pass as ships in the night, meaning they're not temporary, they're eternal. The mystic has revealed eternal verities and has plainly taught us that there is a living presence indwelling all. This constitutes the greatest intellectual and spiritual heritage of the ages. The balance of our knowledge of God must come as a direct impartation from God. We must learn it for ourselves. So in that paragraph, he's giving us an important piece of information. He's saying you cannot think your way into an experience. You have to experience the experience to have the experience. We cannot live from our head up. We have to live a full experience as the mystics did. That bookstore that I mentioned a few minutes ago where the woman came up to me, that bookstore had um, some bookcases side by side. There were two bookcases on one side and two bookcases right next to it on the other side. And, and this set of bookcases had a sign at the top that said theology. And the other set of bookcases had a sign at the top that said mysticism. The theology, um, and I studied theology briefly in college, Theology is really the mental study of religion. If this, then that. And it becomes, if you study theology long enough, you see what a house of cards you build by trying to think your way into, into spiritual experience. But it's, it was filled with the great uh, theologians of, our, of all time, really, St. Augustine and Bonhoeffer and Moltmann and Boltmann and Near Christianity by C.S. Lewis and Orthodoxy by Chesterton, all these great books and theology that tried to reason their way into an experience of God. But next to it were the cases, the bookcases of mystical books, books written by St. Teresa of Avila, um, St. Teresa of Lisieux. Lizou. Um, I mean, it, I suddenly, Father, uh, I'm suddenly blank thinking of all the different uh, mystics, St. Francis, St. John of the Cross, Rumi, et cetera, et cetera. And those books were books written by people who, not, who didn't think their way into it. They lived it. They had the experience of it. The thing I always found funny reading those books of mystical writings from the mystics is almost every time when you read those books, they will say at the beginning, mystical experience is beyond words. You cannot put the mystical experience in words. And then for the next 400 pages, they would try to put it into words. But that just shows you that anything you think you can contain with the mystical experience, it's bigger. It's always, always, always bigger. We can't mind our way into our heart. It's important to have our reasoning mind, certainly, but the heart has its own journey. On page 329, he says this, he says, the mystics have been perfectly normal people. They did not think of themselves as mystics. It, that was their language. It was natural to them, perfectly normal. So on the spiritual path, I've noticed over the years, and some of you who have been on the path a long time, especially those of you who have taught people on the path, and if you're aware of yourself on the path, you know that we often will find any reason to consider ourselves different from the people who are doing the work. Oh, well, they did that because they lived in France. They did that because they didn't have the job I have. They could do that because of this. They could do that because of that. And Ernest Holmes painstakingly several times in this chapter makes it very clear. There is no difference between you, me, and these great mystics, except for the fact that they devoted themselves every day to this journey. And what is the mystical journey? It's the journey of paying attention seeing the divine in all things, in all people, as much of the time as possible. 
he says at the bottom of that page, oh, and he calls that, by the way, courting, courting, uh, consciously courting the divine presence. I love that because it means that every day they chose to be on the path. Every day was a new day. If you read any mystical writings, go back and read St. Teresa of Lisieux. Every morning she woke up and her first thought was, how can I serve you more? How can I serve life more every day? That's a beautiful way. And that's, that's the one thing they did different is that they paid attention and made that their priority. At the bottom of 329, he says, it is through the teachings of the illumined that the spiritual universe reveals itself, imparting to us what we know about God, what we directly experience ourselves, and what we believe others have experienced is all we can know about God. When I first reread this for today, I thought, finally, on page Thank you for saying that on page 329. I had to read 328 pages and you say the only way we can do it is this. But he wanted to make sure that we were all paying attention and we were going for it. But it's really amazing. He says there's two ways of, that we can know about God. One is our own experience and one is believing the experience of people who we believe have had that same experience. I've certainly been in the presence of some of those people. They don't even have to say a word and I can feel it from them. Different people can say the same things. Two people can say the word peace and one of them can say the word peace as loud as they want and you don't feel it, you don't believe them, nothing makes sense. But another person can just, who lives it, can just say the word peace and everything obeys. Ernest Holmes says that is like following the example of Jesus where we know it and then we command it to be true. Oh, in fact, he says the next paragraph, Jesus taught a power transcendent, triumphant, absolute, positive, against which lesser laws meant nothing. By its very presence, it, capital I, it, heals. The mystics did not contend or argue with people. There was nothing to argue about. They saw and they knew. They are the great revealers to us of the nature of the universe and the relationship of humans to God. I love this line where he says that Jesus taught these all, all of these things against which lesser laws meant nothing. There are laws of the universe. We know that. We read that in here. We've talked about it week after week. The mystics knew, though, that there is a higher law than all of these other laws. There really is. And that higher law, mystics would call grace. In fact, there's a famous saying on the spiritual path. We always teach that karma is the great law. What you put out comes back to you. But mystics will say there's something greater and it's grace, grace over karma. Grace over karma, which means if you can enter into the presence, enter into the divine and connect so deeply, it literally bypasses the laws of karma because it transcends them and encompasses them fully. It's really profound. That's something that we could actually just spend so long talking about that one concept, grace over karma. And he touches on it just so briefly in this book, but it's important. Then we get into the meat of the chapter on page 330, unity. The mystics, if you read the mystics, what you find is that there's a theme in all of their writings. The theme is, there are three things, unity, surrender, and being in the present moment. And he begins right there with unity. Everything starts with oneness, everything, including the science of mind philosophy. We begin with the one. 
Joseph Campbell has a great quote. In fact, I put it on this sticky so I would remember to tell it to you. And he said this, this quote is about one as he said, um, he was talking about this idea, the hierarchy of human needs and the first human need according to, to that hierarchy is survival. And Joseph Campbell says, no, 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 no. He says, survival is the second law of life. The first one is that we are all one. That's how important the concept of oneness is. It's more important, Joseph Campbell says, than even the law of survival. So unity is where we begin. And kind of in the middle of the page on 330, he says this, the whole of God is present at any and every point within God. We believe, many of you have been teaching this, learning this, experiencing this for many years, that God is everywhere and in everything. So there is no place where, to make it sound like a bumper sticker, there's no spot where God is not. That sounds funny, but it's actually pretty darn deep. There's no spot where God is not. There's no mountain that you have to go to to have a spiritual experience. There's no cathedral you have to. That doesn't mean you can't. You don't have to, but you don't have to. You don't have to go to the beach. You don't have to do anything because where you are right now is where God is at its most potent for you, wherever that is. Because God, the awareness, the whole of God, he says, happens to be an awareness, not a place. Let's see, let's keep going. Page 331. You can see how we could, by the way, do like a six week class on these concepts. We're just getting the little, the, just the little dash of them, which is exciting and great. And now it's wonderful to live in them as well. 331, he says in treatment, treatment of course, for anybody who might be new listening is our form of affirmative prayer. He says, in treatment, there should always be a recognition of the absolute unity of God and us. We, science of mind, begin with the oneness. We begin with the concept of oneness, but it's really important to say and to know that we don't believe in concept, uh, oneness as a spiritual concept, as a, as a spiritual principle. We believe in oneness as a worldview. Oneness is, for people on the science of mind path, oneness is the path. Oneness is where we begin. Oneness is throughout every moment of the day. And oneness is where we end the day and throughout the night as well. Oneness is how we are taught over the years through every class, through every teaching, through every page of this book is to see things through the lens of oneness. In duality, which is where most of the world is, it's so different. I, I wonder if you can remember what it was like to live in that place of duality. I know so many of you have been on this path for a long time. Remember what it was like to live on the, the path of duality, how afraid you were, how afraid I was all the time. And anytime I thought something was, oh, it's finally good again, then another thing would happen and be like, oh my God, and now I'm afraid all over again. <laughs> That's the path of duality. It's not the path of oneness. Um, my stickies are falling out. All right, uh, let's turn the page. Let's go to page 332. He says this, oh, this is just a point I wanted to make. In the kind of in the middle of the page, he says, all mystics have sensed that we live in one life. And then he has a quote. He says, in him, capital H him, we live and move and have our being. So let me just pause for a moment with the word him, H-I-M, um, for two reasons. One, at the time this was written, it was common to use both genders um, defaulting into him. Many languages do that. 
you know, in Spanish, if you say a male child, it's niño, a female child, it's niña. But if it's a, a couple of children who happen to be male and female, we default back to niños. It's, it's kind of common in language, but as we become more aware, it becomes less okay because we want to be really precise with our language. And he also talks, when he says the thing about him, it can trigger, not trigger us, it can put us back in that place of a him outside of us. But every time he, Ernest Holmes, and we, this community, and the mystics use language like that, we're not talking about a God outside of ourselves. Let's just remind ourselves that we are talking about the indwelling presence. And sometimes we use that language not to say it's separate from us, but so that there's a personification of something that we can relate to even more deeply. I hope that makes sense. Okay, some nods of heads. And we can change the language of anything to fit what we what works for us, especially if it helps us to have a deeper experience. Let me give you a quick example of that. In 1997, um, I was driving up a mountain in Colorado. I don't know how many of you have driven up in the Rocky Mountains. It's so breathtaking and beautiful up there. And if you have, you should just put your little, do the reaction little hand emoji or something. And um, it's so beautiful. Some of you have, it's great. It's like breathtaking up there. And I was driving to go meet a friend. We were gonna do a retreat up in the mountains and it, the retreat was well-timed because I was feeling very spiritually disconnected. One thing that you find on the spiritual path, I'm sure some of you have had it, but there are times when uh, St. John of the Cross called them the dark nights of the soul, where it feels like we are suddenly alone. It feels like there's an abandonment happening somehow. There's wonderful books about it. In fact, go pick up St. John of the Cross's book, The Dark Night of the Soul, and read it. It's unbelievable, especially if you are going through a dark night. But I would, that's where I was at. And I was thinking as I was driving in these beautiful mountains, I was thinking of spirit and I was thinking, gosh, I, I was trying to pray that I wanted that connection back. And it felt like, like somehow spirit had left me. That's how I can explain it. So I'm driving and I'm longing and I'm saying, please just help me, help me understand, help me understand. As I was doing that, a song came on the radio. It's a song that I felt so deeply as I was listening to it that I pulled over um, and tears were running down my face as I was listening to the song. I had pulled over, I had the view of the mountains and this song, and it was a song that was a popular hit in 1997. It was called How Do I Live by Leanne Rimes. And the song itself is a love song. She's singing it to somebody saying, hey, if you leave me, how am I gonna live? But I heard it through the lens, the mystical lens of life. And when I listen to songs like that, whenever they use the word like baby, I just change it to spirit. And if you do that with many songs, you will discover that many songs are actually spiritual love songs. Go and listen to Teddy Pendergrass's uh, Don't Leave Me This Way and do that. Change every baby to spirit and you'll see what I mean. Anyway, so I'm up there and the song comes on and this, these are the words. You can just listen to them. She's saying, how do I get through one night without you? And I was thinking I was in the dark night. If I had to live without you, what kind of life would that be? Oh, I need you in my arms, need you to hold your, meaning spirit, you're my world, my heart, my soul. If you ever leave spirit, you would take away everything good in my life and tell me now, how do I live without you? I want to know, how do I breathe without you? If you ever go, how do I ever, ever survive how do I, how do I, how do I live? I can still put myself 
back in that mystical moment of realization. It's so, it was so strong to realize how much I wanted to make spirit the priority of my life. It reminded me of, of the fact that spirit hadn't run from me. I had somehow run from spirit and I was missing it and I came back. It was very powerful. It's like that amazing song from Ricky Byers, another just amazing mystical writer where she says, God is first in my life, second to none. I bring that up here at this moment because what that means is that through the lens of the mystic, we can see everything as a spiritual experience, even a pop song. <laughs> even a pop song can be a mystical experience. I have a whole playlist of those songs, by the way. Everything I Do, I Do It For You by Brian Adams, Love Thy Will Be Done by Prince, uh, Coming Out of the Dark by Gloria Estefan, etc. Those are really love songs to God. Back to the chapter. I'm going to go now to page 335. We're just going to move it forward to 335. And at the top, he says, uh, about the mystics that have been illumined, they have taught that the kingdom of God is now present, but needs to be realized. So I bet you I could almost unmute any one of you and say, we teach that heaven and hell are what? States of consciousness. Exactly, states of consciousness. That's a mystical concept. That is a mystical concept. The, the mystics, when you read their, their books, their writings, they're very dramatic because they recognize this so clearly that the state of, the, of our consciousness was the most important way of experiencing the divine right here and now. And when we didn't have that experience like I was having on the mountain, it feels like a loss. Heaven and hell, it feels like hell when we don't have the state of consciousness of being connected to spirit. He goes on to say in the next uh, a couple uh, paragraphs down, furthermore, the mystics have taught the ultimate salvation of all people and the immortality of every soul. This is the good news. This is the good news. Life is eternal and everybody is saved. A few years ago, a Christian minister of a mega church named Rob Bell, some of you have heard of him. He had a, a center, a large center, um, and he was teaching Christian principles. But he kept hearing and teaching about hell. And finally, he thought to himself, well, what does the Bible say about hell? And he went into a deep dive into the Bible about hell. And what he discovered is the Bible says this about hell, as Judge Judy would say, zippity doo da about hell. Yes, Judge Judy is a mystic as well. So what he did find, though, are that the things that people said were hell had easy explanations. For instance, the fiery pits that Jesus talked about. He said, in the time of Jesus, people would take their garbage just outside of the, of the town to a pit that they kept burning so they could burn their garbage. Those were the fiery pits. So when he said, it is as if you will be put in the fiery pits, he didn't mean a, an eternal hell because Jesus did not believe in duality. He meant, hey, it'll be like if you go to that garbage place right over there. That's how it'll feel right now. Heaven and hell, states of consciousness right here, right now. In he, It was so powerful. He wrote, uh, Rob Bell wrote a book about it called Love Wins. And what he said is, since there is no biblical concept of God, of hell, there probably isn't any hell, which means everybody gets to go to heaven whatever that may be, because there's not a lot about heaven in the Bible either. It's a fantastic book. It got him in a lot of trouble. He ended up having, the short version is he ended up leaving that church because people didn't want that. They wanted the old time teachings. They didn't want to be stretched 
Um, but it's a great book if you want to read it. Love Wins by Rob Dow. He said this, the mystics taught that man should have no burdens and would have none if he turned to the one. So the mystics are filled with different ways to describe God. Jesus alone said, God is the bread of life. God is the vine. God is the shepherd, etc. So there's lots of different ways that we can kind of use as metaphors to understand the great mystic teachings. I'm going to skip all the way to the end because um, on page 346, because I just want to end it on this note. He says in the final paragraph this, he says, they have taught, uh, oh shoot, I think I forgot my note. Okay. They have taught that in such degree as one's concept of God is sufficient, evil disappears. How are we going to make this practical other than feeling this in our meditation for practical work, for healing, for demonstration? This is what we mean by a method, a procedure, a technique, and a realization that accompanying the method and technique should always come as much of the realization as we can generate at the time. In the method and the technique, something is said. This is a moving thing, but when we reach that other place, illumination, nothing is said, something is, and in all caps, felt. So he ends the chapter by saying, we can't just get this about mystics. We really have to live it. We really have to live it. We, it's very American of us, by the way, to say, let's make mysticism practical. And yet, there is this concept that Ernest Holmes is getting to, which says, mysticism itself is beyond words and beyond rules. However, we can use it to make our lives better. It's not just about sitting in meditation and having the experience. It's not just about having it in yoga and going on a nature walk. True mystics will use their mystic experience, the mystic lens of glasses, not just when things are great, but in the midst of when things look their darkest, their hardest, their most difficult, most challenging, that's when the mystics shine because they know that that is the moment that they were, that they were brought to, however way they were brought to it, to be the light of God itself, the God light within because if they didn't shine the light in the midst of the darkness, who would? Who would? How does a mystic respond while watching the news? How does a mystic respond when being let go from a job? How does a mystic respond in the midst of difficulties with family and friends? A mystic responds the way we began this, this talk, this chapter, with oneness first, not a reaction of fear, but a sense of knowing something higher about the whole thing. This is interesting because this is what we're called to do. This is why our community exists. We know this, we know this. This is why this community exists, to be the lights especially when it feels dark, especially when it feels dark. You are a light, you are a mystic. As we, like the Leanne Rhyme song says, as we learn to realize that everything that we are is because of this mystical oneness, we become more aware and realize it more and more and more. As Prince wrote in closing, in that beautiful song of his, Love Thy Will Be Done, I'll just read this as our closing. He says this, he says, love, capital L, love, thy will be done. I can no longer hide, I can no longer run. No longer can I resist your guiding light that gives me the power to keep up the fight. Oh, love, thy will be done, since I have found you, 
my life has just begun and I see all of your creations as one perfect complex, no one less beautiful or more special than the next. We are all blessed and so wise to accept thy will, love, be done. Thank you, mystic prince, for those beautiful words. And so it is, let's just move into a quick treatment afterwards. Mm, that brought tears to my eyes to just think of that. We're in the oneness right now. We're there. I can feel it everywhere. I can see it everywhere right now. And I know you can too. As Prince said, I can see all of your creations, life as one perfect complex. No one more beautiful or less special than the rest. So we no longer resist this light, this love, this mystical connection, this oneness. Anything that is a barrier to the oneness, we just now proclaim to be melted away so that we can have an even greater understanding of this oneness that is us. Because there can be nothing that is not God. And with this truth, the mystic knows that there is nothing we need except more awareness. There is nothing to get except more awareness. There is nothing that we have to receive except more awareness of the one. So that's what this treatment does. It opens us up for more God awareness. That's the power of awareness. And we accept it, we allow it to be ours right here and now. And we know that the journey that we're on is guided and directed in beautiful ways and that from the highest mountaintops to the depths of the valley, we are the light of God at all times. I know this to be true. I'm grateful for it to be true. I release this truth and I claim it for us right here, right now. And together we say, and so it is. And so it is. <laughs>